morning. It's great to see you. Sing this with me. Well, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that they are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire, it's now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better. I'm not afraid. Well, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of Good morning. There is nothing better than our God, nothing better than our King. That's right. Well, I'm Kenny Lewis. I'm the worship pastor. Let me be one of the first to welcome you here to Grace Community Church. It's so great to have you here. We're going to continue to sing. This is a song that's kind of new to the church too, but the words are great. Join in as soon as you can. God who was, we were 
worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out into the God who always makes a way Cause he hung up on that cross Then he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away Yes, he is! That's right, sing that again. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. That's right. Let's We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely Shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. That's right.
Stop the Lord Almighty. Sing it again. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? That's right. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord?
stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop
Well, good morning. You know, we, we learn in class 501, those of you who have taken that class, that we are lifelong worshipers of God. It's not just about an hour on Sunday morning, but isn't it great to worship as a church family? It just, it just, we can worship driving down the street and all that kind of stuff, but thank you guys for leading us this morning. We're going to continue our worship as we come to our time of communion. If you're new to us here at Grace, maybe not sure how we do communion, you can refer to the back page of your bulletin. Before we get to that though, I need to take a quick poll and I'm going to come here to the edge of, okay, thank you for the lights. I need to see uh, a, one of a couple of things and you have to vote. You can't, can't vote in the middle, but how many green chili fans do we have? Let me see you raise a hand. Green chili. Okay. Now how many of you are red chili fans? Let's see the red chili. Okay, so you can't say Christmas. I get it here in the Southwest. You can do both. But here's what we're going to do for for communion this morning. Those of you that liked red chili, you guys just might as well sit. We're going to let the green chili folks only go first. Now, I'll tell you why here in just a minute. I know that's a that's a silly illustration, but let me let me go a step further. Pastor Rick continues his uh, his sermon this morning. We're going to talk about prejudice. He's got some great things, and I don't want to take away his thunder, but, but something like I just did, there's some of you who may feel very strongly about your chili, but probably for most of you it doesn't matter. But I grew up, I, I graduated from Gar. Let me give you another silly illustration. I guess it's been 41 years ago, wow, that I graduated from high school. You guys didn't even think I was 41, did you? See? So I graduated from Goddard, and we wore blue. But the school across town wore what color? Red. Red. Now, okay, I get there's a lot of Risewell Hive people in here. But as silly as it sounds, back when I was going to high school, you didn't really have a lot to do with those folks on the other school. In fact, when we played each other in high school football, we would do stupid things to each other's school. Roswell High painted our rocket one year. One year before I was even there, I think they put soap in the fountain that used to be there at Goddard. Now, uh, those of us at Goddard never did anything to Roswell High, (laughs) as you can imagine. But we developed these thoughts and attitudes. No one taught me. No one, my parents certainly didn't set me down and say, now you don't have anything to do with those coyotes over there. But we build up in our heart these, these prejudices, these thoughts and these attitudes about people that we don't even know. People that may be different than us. People that may um, have different taste in food or dress differently or different cultures or different races. But you know what? Jesus, when he died on the cross, there were no boundaries. You know, I've always heard it say that, that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And when Jesus, in John 3, 16, when he said that for God so loved the world, he didn't say for God so loved all those people who only like green chili. Or for God so loved the world that he only loved the people from Goddard High School and not Roswell High School. Now I get that's all silly, right? But when Jesus did what he did on the cross, he did it for all of us. No matter where we come from, no matter what attitudes we built up, in our, in our hearts, and our minds, Jesus died for all of us. And as we come to the table this morning, we're on equal ground, level ground with him. And I'm so grateful for that because somebody from Roswell High can say, you know what, that Barry, he went to Goddard High School. I'm not going to talk to him, right? But we can always turn to God. And as you come to the, the communion table this morning. Let's remember what he did for all of us. He shed his blood for all of us so that our sins could be forgiven. And he, his body was broken horribly and bruised on our behalf for everybody. And so as you come to the communion table this morning, thank him for what he's done and thank him for the universal love, the global love for all of us that he has for us, not just back then, but today as well. So let's pray. God, we're grateful that you love us all. and You died for us all. Now, it's up to us to choose to follow you. But your love covers everybody. And may we examine our hearts today as Rick comes and opens your word a little bit later. May we examine our hearts and invite your Holy Spirit to convict and to change where we need to. But Lord, now as we come to the table, as we come to the table as a body, 
And as we've lifted up our voices as a body, God, it's great. Thank you for that privilege this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Start with the front rows, please.
Well, good morning. We want to say a special welcome to those of you who are here this morning, especially our guest. If you're a first-time guest, we would just ask one favor of you. Actually, maybe more than one, but we'll start with the first one. When you came in the back door, you should have received a bulletin, worship bulletin, and inside that bulletin is a little card called a connection card. We would love to have record of your visit. That way you can find out more about us. We can know more about you. And if you will give us your address, we would love to get a gift to you uh, later this week. So please fill that out. Rick will tell you how to turn those cards in a little bit later on. And we're glad the rest of you are here too, not just the first time guest. We're going to take our offering here in just a second. And as our ushers prepare for that offering, I just want to uh, pray here for them. And we'll, we'll take up our offering this morning. God, thank you for this time of worship. Thank you that we are blessed with a building in which we can gather. And God, we know it's, the building is not the church, that we are your people. We are the church. But Lord, we're blessed, so thank you for that. May we take our blessing and bless others, God. May we take our message to the streets of Roswell and around the globe. Just as we heard from Lyndall last week and Matt and Christina, God, thank you for their being on mission for you, that we can have a part of that, Lord, that we can play a role. So, Lord, thank you for the offering we're going to take this morning. Use it to your glory. I know that you can do with it far more than we can ever think of. So, God, thank you for the faithfulness of the people here at Grace. And, Lord, we give praise and thanks for your ever-faithfulness, God. You, you never, ever, ever fail us. So, Lord, thank you for what we're about to take. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a new song for us. It's pretty easy to sing. Sing along as soon as you can. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Oh God, my I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy come. I may not face Goliath, but I have my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh Rock, oh Rock of Ages, I'm standing. Oh God, my God. 
home from college this weekend she says to me dad why are you putting up the flag I didn't know what to tell her so I said I don't know baby it's a it's a nice day seemed like a good thing to do and she nodded walked back in the house now I'm not I'm not that great with words but uh, I thought about it her question while I was out mowing the grass this is what I wish I would have told her. I'm putting up the flag because it's Saturday. And later on, maybe I'll, uh, I'll invite the neighbors, Charlie and Dee, over, and we'll grill something. And, uh, and Charlie and I will get in a good-natured argument about politics or whatever, because we never agree about much of anything, Charlie and I. I'm putting up the flag because Charlie and I can do that here. We can disagree about politics or religion or or whatever, without either of us worrying that somebody's going to come haul us away. And then we'll grill some burgers. Or maybe we'll go cheaper. Hot dogs. Around here, almost everybody can afford a hot dog because we're, uh, we're blessed in this country. <laughs> yeah, blessed. That's why I'm putting up the flag. And then, uh, then tomorrow... We'll go to church, and we'll worship. And I'm putting up the flag because uh, around here, you can think about God, and talk about God, and worship God, and nobody's going to tell you you can't. And, and I'm, I'm putting up the flag because the neighbor kid's in the Marines, and I want his parents to know that I'm proud of him. And I, well... Hmm. I'm putting up the flag because it's a nice flag for a nice place. It's not a perfect place, <laughs> not even close, but it's my place. I'm glad it is. 
So, I'm putting up the flag because it's Saturday and because I can. Nice to be able to put up your flag, isn't it? And thank the Lord for living in a great nation. And by the way, the gentleman on the video, his name is Kurt Cloninger. And if you're going, wait, I've seen that name recently. It's in your bulletin because Kurt Cloninger is going to be live here at Grace later this month. Details are in your bulletin. It's on a Wednesday evening, and he's going to be doing a, his one-man one show uh, called God Views. And so if you've never heard Kirk, uh, seen Kirk Kleininger or heard him, don't miss this opportunity. So it's going to be free will offering. Invite your friends, family, all ages. All ages will benefit from God Views. So Kirk Kleininger right here. He's an old friend of mine. We went to school together. Haven't seen him probably close to 40 years and uh, he's just kind of touring the U.S. right now. And so uh, he called and said, hey, I'm going to be in town. Let's get together. And I said, I got something better. Uh, let me invite my friends to be a part. So you will not be disappointed. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful uh, Wednesday evening together. Hey, Class 501, Discovering Magnification is going to be next Sunday. It was last Sunday, except the storm hit. We got rained out, so we had to push everything forward. So you can register on your connection card. And then this coming Friday, we are sponsoring our GFX, that's Grace Family Experience. And we have rented the rec center pool. And so Friday night, details are in your bulletin again. But man, join us. It's going to be a lot of fun out there. Free food. Kids can swim. Anybody can swim. Um, so don't, don't miss that. It'll be a lot of fun. Hey, do me a favor. Stand up real quick. Say good morning to some people around you. And you can go ahead and say happy 4th of July. Thank you, thank you very much. You may be seated. Great to have all of you here today. Oh, that kind of shocked me. Well, that was a very appropriate song for today. Freedom, freedom. Hey, I got a question for you as we begin. How prejudiced are you? How prejudiced are you? When, when does your prejudice show? Is it uh, racial prejudice, socioeconomic prejudice, political prejudice? Maybe financial or religious prejudice. All right, so we're, we're going to do a little test this morning. This is a true-false test. 18 questions. We're going to go fast. You have to grade yourself. Okay, grade yourself. Your neighbor will not be grading you. And here's the deal, though. You can grade yourself under one condition. You have to promise to be honest. Okay, if you're going to be honest, I'll let you grade your test instead of your neighbor, all right? You ready? 18 questions, true, false. Number one, Mexicans are lazy and steal. Number two, white people are materialistic and racist. Number three, by the way, no comments during this, okay? <laughs> number three, number three, women are bad drivers. <laughs> I said no comments. Number four, teenagers are wild and disrespectful. Number five, Russians are atheist and war hungry. Number six, Italians overeat. Number seven, Baptists are sectarian. Number eight, Catholics don't believe anything. Number nine, public school teachers are humanist. 
Number 10, private schools are rigid and self-righteous. Number 11, Democrats are really communist. Number 12, Republicans are rich and greedy. Number 13, I said no comments. Number 13, blacks prefer welfare to working. Number 14, God is on our government side. Number 15, Jews are tight. Number 16, blondes are dumb. 17, Episcopal priests are alcoholics. And number 18, Texans are braggarts. Okay, how did you do on your test? Uh, here, here's, the, here's the answer for, for your test. If you answered true on any of these statements, your prejudice is showing. Think word, about, about the word prejudice. The word prejudice, prejudge. That's what prejudice is. It's prejudging someone. It's a judgment or opinion formed before the facts are known or in spite of facts that contradict it. Prejudice. How prejudiced are you? Well, in our study today, God is going to teach us what he thinks about prejudice and how he wants his people to deal with the issue of prejudice. Now, to understand this, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, as we talk about freedom and what does it mean to be free in Christ. And today, what does it mean to be free of prejudice? Here's here's the setting in Galatians chapter 2, and it has to do with Peter and Paul, the two great apostles. Here's the deal. Peter is a Jewish Christian. And he has been up north in Antioch at this Gentile church. And when he gets up there, he is just enjoying the fellowship with these Gentiles, treating them brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all one. And he was even, get ready, he was even even having table fellowship with them. In other words, this Jewish Christian is, is eating with Gentile Christians. Now, this was a big no-no for any Jew. It was taboo for a Jew to eat with any Gentile. But now Peter, he understood. He already knew from a past experience that God had opened the door for the Gentiles into the church, that we're all one in Christ. Peter knew it earlier, and now he's experiencing it up in Antioch. Well, what was that previous experience? Anybody remember the story of Peter and the conversion of of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, a Gentile? The story is told in Acts chapter 10, and, you know, God sends Peter, and Peter's kind of dragging his heels to, to share the gospel with this Gentile named Cornelius. Well, long story short, Cornelius accepts Christ, his whole household gets saved, and, and the light bulb turns on for Peter. And he goes, wow, God really does want Gentiles to come in. In fact, Acts 10, verses 34 and 35, here is Peter's light bulb moment. All right, let me read it to you. Verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. And this is right in front of Cornelius at his home. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Now, Peter gets, gets some criticism about this, and so in Acts chapter 11, he continues. So here's the conflict, and then you're going to see how he summarizes it, all right? So chapter 11, verse 1. He's being criticized by these people who say, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and you ate with them. Well, starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, and here's his big conclusion, 
So if God gave them, Gentiles, the same gift he gave us, Jews, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So, remember, Cornelius, light bulb comes on, Peter goes, No, nope, Gentiles can be accepted, I get it. Years later, he's up at Antioch, he's having fellowship, things are great, until one day, a pressure group, those Judaizers, those people who said, you got to be circumcised in order to be saved. It's Jesus plus circumcision and keeping the law of Moses equals salvation. This pressure group comes up to Antioch. Well, when they arrive, bad things happen. Peter caves in. He withdraws fellowship from the Gentiles. As a result, even his buddy Barnabas gets sucked in to this prejudice. Their prejudice, believe me, was showing big time. What is Paul going to do? Well, the Apostle Paul, as we're going to see today, confronts this hypocritical prejudice for one big reason, many small reasons, but one big one. It violated the truth of the gospel because the gospel sets us free from prejudice. And because of that, because this was a big deal, the Apostle Paul confronts it head on. What does the gospel say to us? 2,000 years later, prejudice, can we all agree, in our world is alive and well. Alive and well on planet Earth. What does the gospel say to us about the danger of prejudice? Let's see. You ready? Let's dig in. Number one, if you're taking notes. Number one, first thing we need to do, we need to understand the what of prejudice. We've got to understand the what. And here's what I mean by that. What is so bad about prejudice? What is so bad about showing favoritism and partiality? Galatians 2, beginning in verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, Paul said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, that's that pressure group, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, here it is, even Barnabas was led astray. Paul said, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? There's a good question. So what is so bad about showing favoritism and partiality? Let me give you some reasons in your notes. Number one, reasons we need to reject prejudice. Number one, it's hypocritical. Totally and completely hypocritical. Peter was not practicing what he knew to be right. Guys, anytime any of us show favoritism and partiality and prejudice, anytime we do that, we know better. We, guys, we know better. We know God created all men equal. I think I've heard that this weekend. God created us all equal. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. None of us are better, none are worse. No. So anytime we show prejudice, um, we're being hypocritical because if, now if we didn't know any better, that'd be a different story. Guys, we know better. And if you didn't know better after this morning, you know better. You know what the gospel says. So number one is hypocritical. Number two, very important, it is motivated by fear. Motivated by fear. 
Peter was doing fine until the pressure group came and, and the old question hit Peter. Oh, what are other people going to think? Oh, if I don't join them in their hypocrisy, what are people going to think of me? Oh, I could be criticized or I could be ostracized. By the way, same way in our world today. If you, if you take a stand against prejudice, prejudiced people are not going to like you. And it's going to take courage to stand up and say, hey, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to speak out when I see prejudice. It's motivated by fear. Number three, very dangerous here, it influences others. It influences others. Peter's prejudice was contagious. <laughs> all of a sudden, it just Peter, but it's all the other Jewish Christians. They start withdrawing. And even his buddy Barnabas, you got to be kidding, son of encouragement. He gets sucked in. Prejudice, we have to be very careful. Parents, do you realize if you are prejudiced, you will infect your children with the disease of prejudice. You'll just pass it down to the next generation, the next generation. It influences others. And then number four, the big one, it contradicts the truth of the gospel. What is the truth of the gospel? The gospel says any person can come to God and be justified by their faith in Christ. Anyone can be accepted by God if they will believe in Jesus Christ. The door is open to all. Jesus didn't die for one group or another group or this group or that group, but not that group. No, the door is open to everyone. You know, we used to sing it in Sunday school, red and yellow, black and white. And yet, how did we, I'll tell you how we lived it in my church. Yeah, white and white and white and white. No, God opens the door for all people. All people. Proverbs 29, 25. How about this? Very interesting. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear of man, fear of other people. What will other people think? That's what happened to Peter. It can happen to us if we're not careful. That's why we need to understand the, the what of prejudice. What is so wrong with showing prejudice? All right, number two. Number two, we need to understand the how of prejudice. The how of prejudice. Here's what I mean. How should we confront prejudice. We need to understand because it's going to be around us at work, at school, wherever we are. Sometimes in our extended family we have prejudice. How will we confront prejudice? Well, let's look again at verse 14. A little more detail here. Paul said, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to, to, to Cephas, Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? How do we confront prejudice when it raises its ugly head in our lives, in our family, in our job, school, community? Here's how, here's how Paul did it. I highly recommend it. Number one, confront boldly. Boldly. Man, Paul said, hey, in front of everybody, you know, you got to remember, Paul is up against some heavyweights here. I mean, this is the Apostle Peter, you know, the guy with the keys of the kingdom dangling from his belt. I mean, this is a big dude. And Paul has the courage to confront somebody who has a lot of authority and a lot of power and a lot of influence. There may be times where you are called upon to take a bold stand against prejudice and uh, you may have to do it to people that are like a little over you, maybe in authority, maybe it's your boss or maybe it's somebody in your family that has a lot of authority and clout. Bold, bold. I'm impressed. Paul doesn't back down. So number one, boldly. Secondly, you confront it directly. I love the fact that uh, Paul pinpoints the error. You're not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. He doesn't, he, notice he doesn't start a gossip campaign. 
He didn't go down the street and start a new church. No, what does he do? He said, listen, guys, we got a problem. He confronts it boldly and directly. And then number three, publicly. Now, why did Paul do this publicly? Because Peter's sin was public. A public sin needs to be confronted publicly. A private sin, confront it privately. But Paul did not hide this public sin from public exposure. Because he said, I, I did it in front of them all. Well, who is the all? It's the church. Doesn't mean he didn't go down to the Rosal Daily Record or the Antioch Daily Record, you know, and write an article, send it to the editor. No. It wasn't for the world, but the church. The, Peter had demonstrated hypocrisy publicly in the church, so he confronted it publicly. Um, I was, I, I just had a flashback. Um, man, this was years and years ago. But there was a guy in my church, it, he was a white guy, and he was just prejudiced against black people. I, you know, I don't know where he grew up, but man, it was just in his DNA. And, you know, pretty regularly he would let the slur go or just say something very prejudiced against black people. And, you know, I was with him one time, and he let one rip, and I, boy, it just got one all over me. And I said, you know what? Um, I said, someday when you die and you go to heaven, God is going to move you into an all-black community. <laughs> and he didn't smile and neither did I. Now, I'm not suggesting that in heaven there's all-black communities. But he didn't know that. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I don't like that kind of language. You guys have the courage to do that? Okay, well, buckle up. You need to do that. Take a stand against prayer. You don't have to be ugly about it, but just say, hey, I don't like that kind of language. So I know some of you have had to do that in your job, in your family with off-color jokes and you know, vulgarity, you kind of had to say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't, I'd appreciate it if you didn't talk that way around me. How about let's do the same thing with prejudice? And I'm looking at this audience. If all of us did that in our neighborhood, in our school, in our work, we might challenge some people to take their own prejudice test and see how many true and false they are on their list. We've got to have the courage to confront prejudice whenever and wherever we see it, beginning with the person we're looking at in the mirror. There's a great place to start. Look in the mirror and be bold and be honest. And say, okay, am I prejudiced? Do, or is there anyone out there that I feel like is a, just a little lower than me? you got prejudice. So be honest and, and deal with it. That's the how you confront prejudice. Number three, number three, we need to understand the why. Very important, the why of prejudice. Here's what I mean. Why should Christians oppose prejudice? Here's the big why. Now follow along, beginning in verse 15, because Paul gives a great theological statement, but it all is connected to prejudice. Paul says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I do not set aside the grace of God, 
For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. What is Paul getting at here? Why should Christians oppose prejudice? He gives the theological statement with implications for prejudice. Follow me here, all right? Will, will you please? Why Christians should, should, should oppose prejudice? Number one, because we're all sinners. Verse 17, very clear. We're all sinners. Uh, the light of the gospel exposes the fact that we all need a Savior. So if you need a Savior and I need a Savior, what does that mean about us? We're equal. Now, we could sit around all day long and argue about, um, about who's, who's the biggest sinner. You know, Paul in another place says we, we were all dead in our sins, right? Now, you can argue all day that, okay, you're dead, but I'm deader. And he's the deadest. It's about as ridiculous as going to the cemetery and saying, hey, this guy's deader because he, he died 100 years ago. He's deader than this guy. We don't even use the word deader because there's no such word. And yet we sit around thinking, well, yeah, I, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as... Sin is sin. Dead is dead. We're all in need of a Savior. And the gospel exposes that fact... And that's what Peter and Barnabas and those hypocritical guys needed to understand. Only, our only hope is being justified by faith in Christ. Number two, number two, he says trying harder doesn't help. Verse 18. That's where he says, you know, if I rebuild the law, well, that's, <laughs> if I rebuild the system of justification by works, it only re-exposes how sinful I am. Paul is just showing the ridiculousness of their argument. And he said, when you do that, if you start saying, okay, you're going to be saved by keeping the law, what are you doing? You're just rebuilding the walls of prejudice because the minute you start going by law, you say, well, I'm more saved than you because I keep the law better than you. You fall into that trap. Number three, he says the old person must die. The old sinful nature must die. That means we have to give up trying to earn our salvation and realize, hey, we're all in the same boat here. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. So the old person must die. And then number four, he says the new person must live. The new person must live. We become new creations, Paul says, and now we're motivated by gratitude, empowered by the living Christ inside of us. Bottom line, guys, here, here's the message of what Paul just explained. We're all sinners. We all need to be saved by grace. Here's the point. If you want to be a Christian, okay, if you want to be a Christian, you must stop being prejudiced. Now, you can either be a Christian or you can be prejudiced, but you cannot be both. You cannot be both. You cannot. At least honestly. With honesty, now you, you could hypocritically, but you, you got to decide. I'm going to be a Christian or I'm going to be prejudiced. The why of prejudice is very important. Well, one day, um, an old black man applied for membership in an all-white church. And the pastor was very uneasy about it, and he was trying to kind of put the guy off with all sorts of evasive remarks. And finally, the old black man kind of instinctively became aware that he was not wanted. And so he said to the pastor, he said, I'll tell you what, pastor, this week I'll sleep on it, and I'll just ask the Lord to tell me what I need to do about joining your church. Well, the very next Sunday, the old black man showed back up at the same church and he walked up to the pastor and the pastor said a little nervously, well, did you hear from the Lord on this matter of membership? The old black man said, you know, pastor, as a matter of fact, I did. The Lord said that I might as well give up trying to join your church. The Lord said he's been trying to get into your church for years with no luck. Yeah, in your notes, the gospel makes one fact crystal clear. We're all in the same boat. 
That boat is sinking. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Therefore, there is no place, no room in any way to somehow think that I'm better than you or you're better than me or we're better than anybody else. Barry said it a moment ago, and just so you don't forget it and take it with you, the ground around the foot of the cross is level ground, folks. Level ground. So, how prejudiced are you? Should we do that 18-point test again? Don't let favoritism and partiality and discrimination suck you into the prison of prejudice. Break free. Break free by making a bold and direct, and if need be, public stand for God by standing against prejudice. Guys, let the gospel set you free, and you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Well, Lord, prejudice is uh, just this nagging problem in our culture. One culture after another after another. We see that uh, prejudice leads to conflict, to war, to fights, to hatred, division. Lord, set us free. Set us free. And I pray, Lord, that uh, at some point this week we'll all look in the mirror. We'll ask ourselves a very honest question. How prejudiced am I? God, where do you need to root out prejudice from my life? Give me the courage. Give me the courage to stand against prejudice and let it begin with me. This is our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen.